the goal is to eat more plants. And if you cut out the animals and eat more plants and you be active and you eat, cut out simple sugars and you don't smoke, you're going to, you're going to do okay. You know, I always tell patients like your genes are what your genes are. I have rheumatoid arthritis because my genes had that, but what triggers those genes and what makes those genes how activate what you can control. Yeah. And so, you know, and I always also remember we have what we have, but it's how we respond to it. Right. And so changing your lifestyle now at this moment at 50 or at 20 or at 70, it's never too late. Just mm -hmm. go to it. Let's go. Season three of the plant strong podcast explores those Galileo moments where you seek to understand the real truth around your health and dare to see the world through a different lens. This season, we honor those courageous seekers who are paving the way for you and me. So grab your telescope, point it towards your future, and let's get plant strong together. If you'd like to participate in our Valentine's Day Mystery Dinner for Two, visit plantstrong.com backslash garden to register today. This premium culinary experience is meant to be shared with someone you care a whole lot about. And to make sure that you all nail it, and I mean nail this dinner, we've got step-by-step -step beautifully filmed instructions followed by a live Q&A with the amazing chef, Jamie Simpson. You're gonna learn techniques and methods you've never seen before that she'll be able to use on a daily basis going forward. I learned about half a dozen cooking maneuvers during the filming of this event that I absolutely love, love, love. Register today and you'll receive your box just ahead of Valentine's Day, then We'll release the film on Saturday, February 13th and answer your questions so you have time to watch and then prepare this plant incredible meal. Visit plantstrong.com backslash garden today for all the details. Doctors can be a little cocky. So imagine the humility you must learn when you go from being doctor to patient literally overnight. This is the moment that cardiologist Dr. Monica Agarwal describes as her moment of truth when she was diagnosed with a devastating form of rheumatoid arthritis shortly after the birth of her third child. In an instant, she went from being an avid runner, busy doctor, and engaging parent to someone who could barely move. Anger, blame, denial, you name it, she had it. She also had the answer a change in her diet and lifestyle. Today, Monica and I discuss her journey and her book, Body on Fire, How Inflammation Triggers Chronic Illness and the Tools We Have to Fight It. This roadmap helped her, and I know it will give you hope as well. I am here with Dr. Monica Agrawal. Uh, welcome to the Plan Strong podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. We've actually never officially met before, which is actually surprising given how much I've heard about you, great things about you from um, my father and my mother <clears throat> and my sister, Jane. But um, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. Oh, yeah. So what I'd love to do, I want to dive in. I want to talk about your journey to, to plant-based nutrition. I want to talk about your new book, Body on Fire, right? How Inflammation Triggers Chronic Illness and the Tools We Have to Fight It. I read it. It's magnificent. It is very all-encompassing. You guys did a fantastic job with this. Congrats Thank you. Thank on you. that. Um, <clears throat> but I want, I want to start out by asking you this question. And season three is really about, you know, what was the defining moment in your life, that turning point when the light went on for you, like, wow, you know what? Uh, something as simple as plants can really be uh, 
a huge evolution in maybe the direction I want to go. So was there a turning point, the defining point yeah. for you? Yes, there was absolutely a defining moment. So as a, as a um, clinical cardiologist, you know, we're always talking about the science and we're always, well, where's the data? Where's the data? And then when we're in, when medical school and, and training, I remember when we were talking about lifestyle, that talk and nutrition, it would take about five seconds of medical school. Um, and we would say, okay, you know, and, you know, with heart disease, make sure you get people to eat well and stay healthy and exercise. And that was pretty much, in fact, the interesting thing is on the medical boards and on the cardiology boards, the most common answer for management of cardiac patients is alter lifestyle but we aren't actually taught so well how to do that, right? And that's sort of become sort of the big conversation point is why aren't we teaching our doctors better? So for me, you know, I think I was always interested in lifestyle. I did an integrative fellowship in Univ at University of Arizona um, when I was a fellow. So I was always interested in it, but there was always this, yeah, 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 I'll get to that. Or yeah, 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 that's good in concept um, until I personally became a patient. Um, and I think that was really that life altering moment. So I went from being, uh, you know, I, I have three children and after I had my third kid, uh, I became very, very sick. Um, and I, I was within four weeks, uh, I went from being an avid runner to being unable to climb the stairs. Um, I couldn't, uh, I always tell people that I couldn't, I remember the baby snaps on their clothes. And I remember thinking I was going to write letters to baby companies, uh, clothes companies, because I couldn't snap their clothes. And I thought snaps were ridiculous. Like, why do we even have snaps? And it's the snaps that are the problem because it's not me. And, you know, I changed my shoes three times because I thought, because my feet used to hurt so, so much. And I thought, oh, for sure it's the shoes. I'm going to change my shoes three times. So I went through this time where I was uh, a four week period where I went from being super active to not being, and I was diagnosed with uh, a highly uh, poor prognostic uh, form or uh, a devastating form, they called it, of um, rheumatoid arthritis. And um, rheumatoid arthritis may conjure up some images for some people and maybe not for others of your listeners, um, but typically it's associated with significant breakdown of the joints. It's when, you're, when your body attacks itself and it attacks the joints. Um, and so it classically affects women in their 20s to 50s. And um, what you most notable is something triggers it. There's some sort of inflammatory state that triggers it. And then you just so rapidly get sick. And I remember pain in all my joints and my finger, they were hot and swollen and my shoulders and my, and I had all these things happening so quickly to me. And when I went to the doctor, which took months, by the way, I mean, it took weeks rather, rather by the way, because I was so stubborn. I checked my own labs. I diagnosed myself with Lyme disease because that's mm -hmm. what we do. We're crazy physicians. I thought I had Lyme because I'm a big hiker. So I treated myself for Lyme. I had to go through all of that <laughs> before I finally went to see a doctor who told me I had this condition and that I needed to get on meds within a week. And I was gonna be on meds for the rest of my life. Um, there's no way away out of it. I just need to get and accept that this is my future. Um, and um, they said that that's the hardest part is that, a, uh, is that a patient who's young has to understand that they'll be on meds for the rest of their life. Well, how, how old were you when, when this happened? So this was now, um, I was 37. Okay. So I had just had my third kid. I was 37. And um, so I, they told me, the worst thing they told me was that I had to get off, I had to get on medications within a week because my numbers were so high that I had to get on medicines within a week. So you can imagine, and you know, maybe this is too much information for your read, your listeners, but I was massive. I was gorged with milk. I was nursing all the time. And they said, basically, you have to stop nursing this week. And so in a seven day period, I had to stop nursing my four month old baby. So probably the darkest time for me um, is that are those moments when I look back and think back to those times. And the worst part is I was just given medicines and, mm. and that's it, like no other options. And so my hair fell out and I was nauseous all the time. And, and everybody was would admire how I'd lost my baby weight so fast because I was nauseous, nauseous all the time. And, you know, I, I felt very hopeless. I mean, those feelings of hopelessness and sadness and feeling like 
I had pushed myself beyond and I shouldn't have had a third baby and all that anger. And so I think that was the moment. And even then, maybe I still didn't make a connection until this woman came to one of my events. Uh, I used to do these community outreach events in Baltimore. And she said, let me do your nutrition profile and let me do one for your patients. And I was like, ah, no, 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 I'm vegetarian. I got this. And the irony is I really didn't, you know, right? So you you think you know so much. And as physicians, we're kind of cocky and we're kind of <laughs> obnoxious, you know, we are. And so you know, boy, have I learned humility. And, mm. Um, mm. and so spending time with her, she says, you know, let me just see your nutrition, how you're doing and what you do with your lifestyle and how you live. And it was the first time I really started thinking that beyond, right, that, that there could be more to it, that if something triggered me to develop rheumatoid arthritis at that mm -hmm. moment, then I had a gene. And so if, you're, if you trigger that gene to express itself at that time, then is there a way to suppress it? Mm -hmm. And so it really started me down this path of trying to understand the gene process and epigenomics and understanding that there are ways that you can change your lifestyle to then alter the impact or the expression of the gene. And it started me thinking about how there's things that you can do with what you eat and the connection to the gut biome and then your sympathetic tone. Like I was crazy, you know, when I got diagnosed, I was sleeping four hours. I was always stressed. I was managing heart attacks, but nursing a baby. I had three kids under four. I mean, there's so much we don't appreciate about the role of stress and all of well, those. And you, and you, and, and you talk about that in great length in the book yeah. about basically, you know, finding that balance. And, and typically when your body's not in balance, when your life's not in balance, it can lead to what you just talked about, right? The expression of maybe something um, coming to light, like your rheumatoid arthritis and all other kinds of chronic, chronic illness. Right. So it could be for so many things like people, uh, heart, it could be a heart attack. Why does the plaque rupture? Um, because it, in times of stress, or it could be uh, Crohn's disease or type one diabetes and all these mm -hmm. diseases are, have a genetic predisposition, but then something causes the expression. And I think that's the connection that I, I think is the most important. And the reason we named the book, frankly, body on fire is because yeah. it's that inflammation that we don't talk enough about. It's and I always tell people when people say, "Well, what is inflammation?" It's your body's mad at you. You know, your body is mad, and you have to kind of think about how to make it not mad. And, 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 and it, yeah, yeah. And it seems like as Americans, we almost do everything we can to make sure that our body is always on fire. <laughs> You do. It's so sad, right? It's, it's funny. Like, think about your phone, right? When it's 7%, you're like panicked. You're like, oh my God, I need a charger, right? But like, where's my charger? I need a charger. I need to charge my phone. And so, but yet we don't charge our bodies, right? You know, when we keep going and going, it's funny. I just had a, a meeting with somebody and she said to me, and she said to me, I got, I'm, I'm a chatty person. Sorry. <laughs> She just said to me this very funny thing. She said, she goes, yeah, you know, I know how to tell other people to do well and eat healthy and do well, but I can do more. I can handle more than everyone else. And I just listened to her and I smiled and I was like, yeah, I, maybe you can, you know, because I think that's the problem is that when we're young, we keep thinking that, oh, we can handle it. We can do it. I certainly felt that way. And even as I've gotten older, it's taken time to say no. Mm. You actually can handle it. And mm. it's not a, it's not a badge of bravery or honor to say you slept five hours and still had a full day. I mean, it, it's such a, it's so backwards. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you talk about how your, your daughter saved your life. How, how did your daughter save your life? So if I'm being totally honest, I wasn't at my best. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. Let's go with the total, total honesty. <laughs> So if I'm being totally honest, I would say that I was not at my best when I got diagnosed with RA. Mm. I was probably mean. I was probably angry. I mean, I was definitely angry. And I, I blamed her. I, I blamed my third kid. I had a lot of, if I hadn't tempted fate, if I hadn't had her, then I wouldn't have gotten sick. And I was, I was dark. And I, uh, I, it took me months and years, arguably, to understand 
that she was giving me a sign that she was teaching me how, and it was only because of her and her, because I got sick that I learned how to get better. Otherwise I would have been on the same track. I would have continued to be doing, um, can you continue to be doing the same thing, taking, just giving out prescriptions, giving out more and more Lipitor instead of teaching people about nutrition. If it wasn't for her, I would never have learned how to do better. So I always, I, I feel great sadness about how much anger and I had and how much I blamed my kid. And it was really her who saved me because if I hadn't gotten sick, if it wasn't, I would never have been better. How was your relationship with that third kid now? <laughs> that little sprightly kid is nine years old and is incredible. <laughs> she is. Yeah. She is me on steroids. Like she is me, but at nine years old and she's fabulous. And she has read that story recently, actually for the first time. Um, and it was interesting. I didn't give it to her to read and she just picked up my book and she started reading it and I saw her tearing up and uh. Uh, it was really sad actually. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, she said, it's mama because I made you sick. And I said, mm -hmm. no, 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 baby, you didn't make me sick. That's the beauty of it all is it's because you actually fixed me, you healed me. Mm -hmm. And I will always be thankful to you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, our kids can really, they, they can heal us in ways we never imagined. They really can. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I, I wanna ask you about all kinds of things. Before I, I do though, um, so you decided to go into cardiology why cardiology a and b how hard is it going into cardiology being a woman um being a female i mean i would in my opinion it seems to be kind of dominated by by men and i'm wondering if they felt threatened by you at all and was that a tough row for you um go yeah, for it <laughs> sure so uh you know i've always been somebody who's liked where things make sense. And so cardiology to me was the field that made the most sense. If you do this, this happens. I'm not super smart. I just, and I can't maybe think out of the box. I like that you do this, this happens. If you change this valve, this happens to the valve leaks. If you fix this valve, this happens. And so everything is very, very physics of the, the heart is fascinating. And I, so I, I love, and I love being part of acute medicine. I like rounding the ICU. And then I love also the teaching and there's so much you can do in cardiology. I also like that. It's not just one thing. You can do so many different things in cardiology. You can do prevention. You can read stress tests. You can read echoes. You can round, you know, you can take care of highly sick patients. And one of the most gratifying pay things to do in cardiology is that a patient who was totally normal then comes in with an acute heart attack and then you fix it. You fix it with a stent or you do a procedure and they get better so quickly. And that's a miraculous thing as well and shouldn't be undervalued. And so I think cardiology has all that in one. So I do you was do really, any of that? Do you any of it? I don't do stents. No. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm a preventive cardiologist. So I reduce the business of those procedures. <laughs> I, can, I spend an hour with my patients. Every single prevention patient gets at least an hour, sometimes an hour and a half of my time. Bless and you. <laughs> I love it though, because you, I just had the best day. I'll tell you one little offside because I know to answer your other question, but I had the greatest patient come in the other day and he came in and the first time I saw him, he's 350 pounds and he was so sad and he was sad about his weight and he had some personal issues going on in his life that were, and he had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And he came in his wife and he couldn't look at me, look at me in the eyes and he didn't have eye contact. And there's so many sad things. And we spent an hour and a half together talking mm -hmm. about life and about self-love and about positivity and nutrition. I know I do a lot of like self-love because I think that so much of the time we eat when we're not, when we're, we don't like who we are. And so we talked a lot about that and he came in now to yesterday, for two months later, two and a half months later, he was smiling. He goes, hi, Dr. A. And I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> hi. And he had lost, he's 350 pounds, which is really a lot of weight and very difficult when you're at that level of weight to lose weight um, because there's so much motivation, needing comfort, et cetera, from food. And he'd lost 13 pounds. He was playing basketball with his kids. I cut back on one of his blood pressure medications. I was like, yes, but who is supporting that, right? I mean, I spent mm -hmm. all that time with this patient and I get great joy and the patient does better 
but that's not what pays the bills, you know, so to speak, you know, and so that's not what the hospitals are inclined to support. So they will support it because it's the right thing to do, but it's not what makes the money. Yeah. Well, it, pays, it has great dividends to your soul and the good, yes. good work you're doing there. I, I have to tell you, it's like, I told you about my bees. I feel like these patients are, they're my people, you know, and I yeah. got to like take care of them. And I, we, you know, I can't even, I love to hug and I can't hug them because of COVID. So we have these like virtual yeah. hugs going on. <laughs> it's awesome. But and what about, have, yeah. The second part of the question was being a female. Yeah. So yeah, it's rough. Uh, I don't know. There were times that I debated if I should have gone into cardiology. I debate sometimes when I mentor a lot of young women. For a while there, I didn't want to mentor them because I wasn't sure I would tell them to go into cardiology. Because not because it's a, not a fantastic field. It mm -hmm. is. It's just not female friendly. And so, but so I had to decide and I had to, had, had to think over the last two years, do I want to be part of that or do I want to help change it? So currently, you know, 50% of doctors are female right now, but only wow. 10 to 12, yeah, but 10 to 12% are only cardiologists. 10 to 12%, that's terrible numbers. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, there's so much pressure. It's so long that the training is so long. You are expected to do as much uh, you have to, you, you know, at the time of your life when you want to have kids. So for me, I wanted to have three, four kids. I didn't know what I wanted, but I wanted a lot. And I wanted to have all these kids and you can't, like, if you have kids while you're in your training, people are like, of course you can have a kid when you're in your training, but they look at you like, oh, I have to cover your call. She was out for three months. You know, like that's what I would have heard. And, or at least that's what I felt I would have heard. You know, I used to, re I remember hearing something from one of my partners when I was already a faculty member. He goes, hey, Agarwal, why don't you come out and why don't you have lunch with us every day? And I was like, well, I, I don't have lunch with you every day because I got to work during lunch so I can go pick up my kids from school. Uh, I'm, so that's why I don't have lunch with you. And he's like, well, come on, man. Uh, and I bring my, and I said, I bring my lunch. And he's like, well, why, did, why did you do that? Who, you know, like, you know, I, he's like, why did you do that? You know? And I said, well, you know, I, I gotta, I don't have a wife at home. And so I have to, uh, I gotta have to take care of my own lunch and I gotta take care of my kids. And he's like, well, man, I, I didn't ask you to do that. You should just go home and do that. And I was like, wow, you know, this is like, that was probably four years ago, 2016 people are Incredible. saying that to me. Amazing. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult field, but it is super rewarding. And what I've learned and come to is that I want to support the future generations of women. And so I now mentor actively uh, young women cardiologists mm -hmm. and residents because I want people to see I'm done with the years of not talking about my kids. I used to not talk about them. I mean, like massive breastfeeding, pumping, hiding everything, because I didn't want anybody to know my weaknesses. You know, I'm done with all that. No yep. more hiding weaknesses. This show, is who I am. Yeah, show the weaknesses. That's a strength. That's who yep. I am, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, well, let me ask you this. So as a, as a cardiologist, I, I think I'd love for you to like, let our listeners know what are the two major types of ways that people have heart attacks? Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So imagine a blood vessel is like a pipe. Uh, so if I, if this is the pipe and this is the blood vessel. So when you first are born, this is super clear, pink and soft. Um, by the way, at that time, your LDL cholesterol, I like people to know this is about 40 to 50. Yeah. Nice. Yes. So that's really important to know because people are like, oh, my LDL is 120. I heard it was okay. Like, well, let's just regroup when you're 40 to 50. So when other, I also say that as a pitch because people are like, well, I need cholesterol for my neurons, right? But when you're a baby, that's when you're having the most neuron development, right? Myelin sheaths and all that. Yeah. Um, and that's when your LDL is 40 to 50. So uh, to give people perspective, I just like people to know that. Okay. So but but let me stop you for a second. Yeah. So that's your, that's what your LDL is. But typically, do you have any idea what the HDL and the total cholesterol is in relation to so, that? Um, the HDL when you're born, I don't, don't quote me on it, but I seem to remember yeah. it's in the 30s or so. Yeah. So your total cholesterol will always is typically less than 100 as a child. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that's the total is under 100. Yeah. So, um, 
So, okay, so the blood vessel's pink and soft, and as you exercise or move, it dilates. That's the job. That's vas called vasodilation. And you have these little cells on the outs on the on the the edge of the of uh, the wall called endothelial cells. And Essie loves to talk about endothelial cells. Oh, he's he's the master of it. Yeah, he's the, he loves <laughs> endothelial cells, which I love that he loves that because I'm like you and me, we're people. So. Um, <laughs> So you've got these endothelial cells. Okay. So as you're going through your life, eating fatty food, McDonald's, smoking cigarettes, do um, maybe eating too many sweets or not exercising, not to say that would be what we would all do, but might happen. And mm -hmm. so if you had some of those kind of habits, what happens is that blood vessel starts getting cracks in it, these little fissures in them. And so your body is like, oh my God, I got a crack in my blood vessel. And so the body's like, no problem. I've got platelets here. And so it triggers inflammation. And so all those little platelets come over and they make a little Band-Aid on your little crack. And so, well, on that little Band-Aid, then you put on top of it, then cholesterol floats by, and then it builds up a little bit more of that little scab that's now forming here. And then you have all these other, so more and more cholesterol. And so all over time, you build this little plaque and it has this little cap on it. Does that make sense? So yeah. that is your blood. So is, it, is it almost like a, a pimple of sorts or not? Sure. I like yeah. that, a pimple. So if you have a scab on the outside of your body, then it doesn't matter if it's this big or this big. But when you're in a blood vessel, mm. the more that scab fills up, the less blood goes through. So then when you're exercising, your body's like, yo, I need some blood. So, you know, I need blood. Let's get the blood through. And the heart's, the heart's like, well, what do you want me to do? I got like this much space to get past my, past my, my clog, yeah. right? And so that's how you develop angina in times of exercise, typically, right? You're exercising, your body needs blood and it's like, I don't have the blood. So you get angina. And so that angina is kind of that precursor of a problem. And for people that don't know what angina is or an angina, what is that? So angina is the actual chest pain that happens when the blood flow to the heart is compromised. Okay. Yep. So these blood vessels are now, and just to clarify one step before, your heart is this pump, right? <laughs> And there are three main blood vessels on top of it called coronary arteries. And then there's the aorta that pops out of the heart, so, which gives blood to the body. But if the coronary arteries, which are here, mm -hmm. don't give blood to the heart, the heart can't pump and blood can't go to the body. So when we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about those arteries on the heart that feed the heart. And when we're talking about this pipe and the smooth pipe and the heart attack, we're talking about coronary arteries. It's not that you can't build plaque in your neck, which are your carotids, or in your brain, which are cerebrovascular arteries, which can cause strokes, or in your legs, which you can cause plaque, which can cause um, claudication and plaque buildup in your legs. Those are all the same process, but they're not heart disease that we're talking about when we're talking about heart attack, mm -hmm. which is those arteries. Okay. So when we're looking at that pipe, so at, there are two ways for this scab to cause you trouble. If this scab builds up over time and then just fills up this clog, yep. uh, this blood vessel, sorry, then you have a heart attack because there's nothing blood. A heart attack is absence of blood flow to part of your heart. And so if this doesn't get blood, if there's, it's all full of clog, then there's no flow. That's called what we call a non ST elevation MI. That's for those of you who are more science, who care about that stuff. But what that means is this is actually the more benign heart attack. And I say benign in quotes because it, it has a very high mortality as well. But the reason it's more benign is your body's had you time to get used to it. So as you're building up over time, the body's made other blood vessels called collaterals to work it out around this clog. Mm hmm so your body, you build it up over time. It happens over time. Typically people have angina or they'll have shortness of breath or some sort of manifestation that maybe they ignored or didn't ignore. Um, but usually there's some symptoms. This is when you have an abnormal stress test. You go for your stress test. It's abnormal. And then you're like, my doctor said, I need to be more aggressive with my medicines or I need to have a stent or whatever. They may say that, but that's based on the buildup of the plaque slowly over time. The rub is, it, is, and is it, you know, no, and I was going to say, is it safe to say that that then, it, but is it more of a stable plaque? 
Correct. That's a more stable plaque. Absolutely. And think about the reason that is, is because over time it's just getting hardened and fibrous and all the crud's kind of sitting on top of it and sitting, it's just getting layered and layered on. And so they can rupture, but they are less, they're much more stable. So they kind of just slowly build up along. Mm -hmm. The problem is the small plaque. So I will tell you, if you look at studies from 20 year olds who died in Korea and in Vietnam, they already have plaque in their hearts. And so I, I say that importantly because the small plaques are the problem. So the little plaques are the plaques that just kind of got, remember, go back to your, in your mind, to the crack in the blood vessel, the platelets came over, inflammation, and you get this little plaque. But maybe those plaques didn't build up all the way for whatever reasons, or can be lots of reasons. Maybe you got a little healthier, or maybe that plaque didn't, didn't have little swingers on it to get more things attached. So you get these smaller plaques, but then something about that plaque, because it's not as calcified over, it's definitely more unstable and it's mm -hmm. more prone to rupture. And so what can happen is, is you could be chilling out, having a great day. And then that plaque, it explodes and it goes from being this little guy to totally occluding. That is a massive heart attack. The outcomes are very hard, poor, and you have to go to the you have to go to the hospital, and you have to go for a cath, and you have to get a stent. So let's just be very clear. Unlike the stable mm -hmm. plaque, the unstable plaque in the acute heart attack, you have to get a stent because that vessel is occluded and occluded so fast that the only way to open this one is quickly opening it or, or you will, you probably, but you won't can't you, it's very difficult to make it. Yeah. But uh, well, I, I think that I've read that 50% of the time when you have a heart attack like that, yeah. it's usually like instant instantaneous death. I mean, That's so you're correct. saying the other 50% that you just like within hours, you have to get to a hospital and have That's that stem put in. Yeah. It's like, I think about a third of the patients will die suddenly. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a catastrophic. And um, I think the thing to, uh, that's why I really like doing prevention because if you can prevent those soft, small, soft plaques from building, then you're not going to be prone to a heart attack. But I also mm -hmm. tell people like, just because they tell me that they had a negative stress test, like, so what? That doesn't mean you, that just means you don't have a 70% plaque in your blood vessel. Well, if you have 30% plaques, you're going to run on the treadmill just fine yep. until you smoke another cigarette or do something inflammatory that makes that plaque rupture that acute heart attack. So it'll basically be invisible for the most part. That's correct. So let, let me ask you this. Um, do you have any idea, like your typical American, let's say American male in their middle 50s, if we were to able to go in, stick our head in, you know, one of their coronary arteries and look for, to see how many of these juvenile plaques there are, would there be like two? Would there be 50? Does it, I mean, is it a pimple party in there typically? <laughs> I love the pimple party. I'm going to have to use that. So, because my visual image of my son's going through puberty right now. Yeah. So I'm imagining all this. Little <laughs> yeah. Too much information. Okay. So, um, so the answer is, I don't know for sure. And the reason is, is because every person is so different. But if I use, um, we have this thing called CT angiogram now, where we actually can look at the heart arteries with dye and do like a CT, so like an X-ray of those arteries. And yeah, we're finding loads of little 25 mm -hmm. to 50% plaques, loads of them. And so, and remember, and the other thing I, the reason I say that this is important is because when you do a heart catheterization, you may not detect a 25 to 50%, at 50 you would notice, but a less than 25% lesion, you may not see. Because mm -hmm. imagine a coronary artery is when we do a car cardiac catheterization, we inject dye into the hole. So all you see is the glow in the dark outside vessel, right? Like the outline, does that make sense? Yep. So if you have an acute heart attack, will you see this like it's gone, right? But if you have a small dip it down and then goes back up, you may not appreciate as a cardiologist that there's a little plaque there. Now we have much more advanced technology now with 
CT and the cath lab, et cetera, where we can look at, um, where we can actually look at those blood vessels from the inside. But in the general, most people, if you just have 25 to 50% plaques or 25% plaques, you're just going to be told essentially normal or less than, you know, mild disease, mild, you know, but, uh, and then people go home often with this concept that they don't have heart disease. And I hate that because I'm like, wait, 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 let's go back and look at this. Well, I've, and I've read and I've heard from my father that, that, almost 90% of heart attacks are caused by these juvenile plaques, which leads me to believe that most of us are unwittingly walking around <clears throat> with pimple parties that, yep. just, that, that are susceptible to, uh, you know, whether it's um, just the, our body's out of balance or uh, the, the stresses we're putting on it that, you know, you're doing whatever. And then all of a sudden that, that little pimple explodes and, and you're in trouble. It is true. But I also want to not have everybody panic like every second that, you know, all <laughs> these pimples are like exploding inside of them are going to explode any minute. Yeah. I think the thing to reassure us is that if we eat healthy and, you know, again, that discussion, I think between you and me is very clear, but not to everyone, which is that you eat almost you know, you could say mostly plants, all plants, you know, I am an all plants kind of gal, but the goal is to eat more plants. And if you cut out the animals and eat more plants and you be active and you eat, cut out simple sugars and you don't smoke, you're going to, you're going to do okay. You know, I always tell patients, like your genes are what your genes are. I have rheumatoid arthritis because my genes had that, but what triggers those genes and what makes those genes how activate what you can control. Yeah. And so, you know, and I always also remember we have what we have, but it's how we respond to it. Right. And so changing your lifestyle now at this moment at 50 or at 20 or at 70, it's never too late. Just mm -hmm. go to it. Let's go. So that was going to be my next question. And I'd love okay. for us to expand on it. And that is, so you know, I'm the, I'm the typical American that's got all the typical stressors and I'm eating the standard American diet and I'm not sleeping enough and I'm a couch potato um, and I've got a pimple party in my, you know, coronary arteries, I'm susceptible to, to uh, having one of these things rupture and burst. So what, like, and you talk about this at great length in, in your book, but so what's the protocol? I mean, let's go through Maybe we maybe let's start with what are some foods that we should eliminate, sure. and then what should we bring on board for starters? Sure. So there's the where I want people to be and where they are isn't always it's not always sort of black to white like we can get from here to here in one time. Mm -hmm. And so at least in my patient population, often if I get people anywhere closer to this side, I'm really happy and keep pushing every time to get them closer. So if I were to give a message to the audience, I would say, you know what, don't feel bad about what you're not doing, but just focus on what you're doing right and try to get better every day. Um, so what, what to eliminate? So in terms of elimination, my hard fast eliminations are red meat, um, fried foods, um, uh, dairy, and that's one that is contentious. And, um, and when you say dairy, do you mean all dairy, all forms of dairy? I say all dairy, but if they say I really need my yogurt, I'll say yogurt you can keep uh, at the beginning. Again, it's always a transition for me. And so I mm -hmm. look at the person and sort of see what they're willing to do. Um, so, and then, you wouldn't look at them, you wouldn't look at them and say, yeah, you, I understand you like your yogurt, but there's so many amazing plant-based yogurts that are out there right now, and you're not going to miss the, the cow's milk. Sure. I typically will stay that conversation and they'll look at me like, look, you're taking my steak. Uh, uh, or, and so if I have to choose that battle, I'll say, okay, let's just do eliminate the steak and I'll know I'll tackle that next time. Yeah. Um, and that's okay with me. I, I, I don't let the enemy of perfect is, uh, yeah. enemy of good is perfect. Right. Um, so I, I do my best and I will tell you that's really worked for me because when I first started in practice, I was like, look, you need to eat these foods, you need to do this, and this is the end of the line. And people would come back or wouldn't even come back because they'd be like, it was too hard, it was too much, I couldn't do yeah. it. 
you know? And so I find that this sort of transition, if I just get people to eat more plants, I'm doing great. Good. So no uh, red meat, no fried food, um, no dairy and uh, no processed foods. So that's what, is, my what does that mean? Processed foods in your book? So for me, processed foods, and most foods are processed, as your point is well taken, um, that most foods, we process them in order to eat them, even oats, right? If you take it away from a steel cut oat to make it into a whole rolled oat, we've processed it. So what I mean by process, I usually mean things that have, if you look at the ingredients, there are ingredients you've never heard of. Um, if there's preservatives in them, if we've taken the original form and we've shrunk it down from a normal oat and we've shrunk it down to an instant oat, that's very processed. So those are things I think about when I think of process. If they have added sugars, that's usually a processed food. So those are things that I, I would tell people to avoid. Now that freaks people out. But usually if I, I do some of that and they'll do half of it, maybe usually after the first yeah. visit, great. Um, what about so white, like white flour and white, you know, pasta and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So yeah. for tier one, I usually start with that in terms of eliminations. Um, and then I move into as they come back and they get more comfortable with how they've done like, oh, you know, it wasn't that hard to give up red meat. And you're like, yes, um, then I may I'll add in the next tier, which is like, well, now let's talk about less chicken. And like, wait, wait, you're taking my chicken? I was like, look, you got rid of your red meat. Let's go with chicken, right? I'm like, I'm one of those like typical moms. I'm like, I'm glad you said that because now we're going to do this. No, so. And then <laughs> so when, tell me this, when, you, when you're trying to get, you know, take away the chicken, which I did with, you know, these firefighters, yeah. are you saying, well, you know, do they say why? I thought chicken was healthy. And then what do you say? Yeah. So, um, so I would tell, I usually tell people, well, chicken is healthier than red meat, but not as healthy as no chicken is usually how I tell people. And so I always remind people that all animal products have cholesterol. So that's important to understand that plant products don't have cholesterol. And then somebody will say, well, I need cholesterol because your body needs cholesterol to make uh, again, we go back to the neurons and yeah. cells, cell walls. But remember, your LDL is 50 when you're born, so you don't need a whole lot of LDL. Then you go back to the baby story. <laughs> yeah, you got to go back to baby. You gotta, yeah. So, um, so there's that. And so, um, I then I also tell them that that chicken has lots of saturated fat and that was another negative, which also predisposes them to heart disease. And then I, if I, if they're really interested, I'll go into the TMAO story. Um, and that really then blows their mind. <laughs> I'll so, even so, pull up the picture. So, yeah. So, um, so our listeners don't feel left out. Um, let's talk for a sec. So you mentioned, cause we all know that red meat is loaded with cholesterol, saturated fat, typically 40% of it's, coming from saturated fat, the fat. Mm -hmm. Chicken, a lot of people don't know, but chicken is about 30% saturated fat, even That's your leanest correct. piece. And I, and I, in your book, I love it. You guys talk about how a lot of people reference this pure trial that says that saturated fat is not the enemy and that the enemy are carbohydrates. And, and the response that you have is that, and I'm quoting right now, it is not that saturated fat is good and carbohydrates are bad, but rather that saturated fat is bad and simple refined carbohydrates are worse. That's exactly so, right. Yeah, yeah. But so you tell your patients, yeah, saturated fat. But because most people, especially the paleo and the keto and now the carnivore, uh, you know, tribe, they're thinking saturated fat is good. But the preponderance of the scientific evidence doesn't, doesn't tell us that, right? That's exactly right. So in general, and so this is a source, what you're bringing up is become a source of contention in cardiology in the community in general, because there's a, there's a, a small group of cardi. So our guidelines are based in our guidelines, say 2018, 2019 prevention guidelines say that a diet that is low in fat, high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, fish, uh, and I think we add in low fat dairy are, is the optimal preventative guideline. That's what the guidelines say. 
However, in the last year, and really for years now, this question of whether saturated fat or cholesterol is good, oh, that study was bad. That's why it said that saturated fat is not, you know, is the enemy or not the enemy. But, you know, 75 to 90% of us still believe that saturated fat is the problem. But there are certain studies that you can find, often that are retrospective, that look at, uh, and some of the prospective ones too, that show that saturated fat is uh, okay. But they're exact, as you see here in the quote, they're not comparing like things. Mm -hmm. They're comparing it to all carbohydrates. Well, a, a whole bean in a, in a cracker or a chip, that's like comparing oranges and, I don't know, uh, footballs. Like they're totally different things, you know? And so if you, if you look at the studies carefully, it's not exactly that. It's not that saturated fat is good, but that the carb, the simple carb is bad. And so to all the people who come into my clinic and say, I want to eat low carb, uh, I'll ask them, well, why is that? Why do you want to do that? Oh, I'll lose weight better. Well, actually, that's not true either. When we studied low fat versus low carb, there is no difference in the weight and so it's not that low fat, low carb does so much better. Um, okay, well, my lipids will get better. Well, actually, that's not true. So there's a huge range in lipids or LD cholesterol in patients. Some people do get better, but some people don't. Let's dive in. You brought up TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. Can you let our listeners know kind of what that is, where it comes from, and why it's a bit of a hellish molecule? Yeah. So TMAO, trimethylamine N oxide, is interesting because um, Stan Hazen from the Cleveland Clinic sort of discovered, kind of put this on the map. And basically what he did was he gave everybody um, radio iodinated meat, like a steak or cheese or eggs, you know, and those are the things that were given in, in, in particular. Because when you eat those foods and they go into your gut, then your gut via the liver makes this thing called trimethylamine N oxide. And so what, cap what he found was the people who had the highest amount of trimethylamine oxide in their body also had the highest cardiovascular events, a risk. And so the interesting, the most interesting thing about this, and so he gave all comers, so he gave omnivores this, and he gave vegans this. So I don't know how he got vegans to eat a steak, but uh, you know that blows my mind. But uh, he was able to get vegans to do it. But what was most interesting was that when he gave the omnivore the uh, the radioiodinated meat product, the TMAO levels went up within 12 hours. So shoop, up within 12 hours. But when he gave it to the vegan, the TMAO levels were flat, mm. which makes you realize that the gut is everything. And so it just shows because the vegan has a healthier gut flora and a different gut flora than even if they have one, they have that one challenge of that meat product, their TMAO level didn't go up. So, but are you, but are, there, are you then saying that the, the, the TMAO, it's a byproduct of the bacteria with yeah. the meat. And so the, the vegans, didn't have that. And so that's why they didn't produce the TMAO. That's, that's what we have to think, but it's the bacteria in their gut, not the bacteria in the meat. I just want to make sure I, I understood Got that. Yeah. Right. So right. In, in the gut, that's correct. I mean, that's what you have to think. I mean, that's fascinating and mind blowing. Now we don't know for sure. Cause the skeptics of TMAO will say, I don't know for sure that it's causative. And that is true. We don't know that if you have high TMAO, you're going to have more heart disease. But we know that there's a pro, there's a whole sequelae, you know, these certain types of patients have who have like these multiple risk factors and who eat these kind of foods, they have higher TMAO and they have more events. Yep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> back so, to the okay. chicken. So back to the chicken. High TMAO, <laughs> don't eat it. <laughs> yeah. So the foods that we should be eliminating, right? You talk about red meat, the processed refined foods, the added sugars. And then all dairy. So, Fried food, or, all dairy, yeah. and then we go to chicken. Yep. And so I'm sitting in your office and I'm like, okay, well, Monica, what do you want me to eat? If you don't want me eating that stuff, what can I eat that's going to make that pimple party be non-existent, my gut flora, you know, become a fortress? What do I do? 
So for the people that are really advanced heart disease or mostly or more motivated, I really start with stage all the tiers at once, removing all those foods, even the chicken and fish, if I can get them to. And then what do I add back? So I add back more. I tell people I want them to pea green, you know, and I don't literally mean that, but I sort of do. Um, you know, I always tell people about the story of my son. Uh, you probably don't want to know too much information. I was going to tell you about my son's poo uh, when it turned blue. Well, no, no, the, the reality, I, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up because at our medical immersion programs that we've been throwing since 2010, we, you know, the, the people start talking about because we have them eating yeah. five to six servings of green leafies a day that people start, it becomes conversation. Oh my God, my poo is green. Yes. Yeah. That's how, you know, when you're eating enough green. Yes. And you're like, yes, we have achieved. Yes. So that's it. It's, it's at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, mostly yeah. vegetables, less fruit. And some studies show up to 10 servings per day. So what I tell people is go buy baby kale and just get, buy stock in it and just get like bags and bags of it and make a salad every day that's bigger than your head. And when I say bigger than your head, I mean that to be the green part. You know, you can add what a lot of other things, but the greens should be bigger than your head. And so, um, you know, and so people are like, can I have tomatoes, onions? Yeah, anything you want that's rotting in your fridge, have at it. <laughs> the greens should be bigger than your head. And so, yes, five to seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And remember, a serving is not three strawberries. It's a, base, it's a baseball-sized fruit or a cup of uncooked vegetables or a half a cup of cooked vegetables. That's a serving. So as you're thinking about five to seven to 10 servings, that's the goal. I'm so glad you said that because I know in the book you talk about how in like 1990, the World Health Organization talked about how we want to be getting, you know, 450 grams of fruit and vegetables a day. I'm like, that's the most ambiguous thing I've ever heard. What does that mean? That has no real life bearing for anybody. And I don't even think five to seven servings does. I'm, so I'm glad you said the size of your fist, the size of your head, right, for the green leafies. And I, I mean, frankly... You know, I would say that if I had to count up how many servings of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans I eat a day, it's probably 25. Yeah, good. I mean, that's great. And so that doesn't even include, right? So when we're talking about the greens, yeah. this is like the salad for lunch. That doesn't include like the other servings that I want you to get. So I agree with you. By the end, when you're really engrossed and we have you, then we, then they are, people are able to count up, well, I had greens with breakfast. I'm like, yes, that's yeah, when yeah. I know I, that's when I know I have you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so you want me eating fruits and vegetables? What else? So, um, so beans, uh, lentils, so loads of beans and lentils, but you know, um, one of the things, you know, so yes, lots of beans and lentils, but I, that shouldn't discount the need for all the greens. So sometimes people, when they switch over from red meats and they eat, they eat vegetarian, they end up eating a load of beans and then they haven't really done the greens. So I just want to emphasize that it's greens and then the beans go on top or, you know, and so those are important, absolutely important and a great source of protein and calorie density that we need when we eat a lot of greens, but it, it's greens and then beans. So lots of beans, what kind of beans, any kind of bean you want. Should you use a can? Should you use a dry? Well, yeah, it's nice to use dried beans because they're the most optimal, but you know what? I've got three kids, a full-time job. Cans work sometimes too. Is there more sodium in a can? Yes. If you have high blood pressure, should you wash them really, really well? Yes. Would dried be better? Yes. Is frozen vegetables good? Fine. You know, is fresh better? Sure. But you know, that doesn't mean the reason I say it that way is because I think yeah. so much of the time we get caught up in frozen or fresh. Yeah. However you can get it. You know, I have patients that are sometimes don't have the means or are on SNAP programs. Like what? Well, get frozen. That's okay. You can still get your vegetables that way. No problem. Yep. yep. So what do we say? Beans, lentils, any type you like, enjoy them. Green, yep. uh, beans, greens, whole grains. What about, what's your opinion on nuts and seeds and, and, um, and, and fats and oils? Yeah, so nuts and seeds, 
nuts are, I am usually supportive of nuts and seeds, depending on the patient, depending on their cholesterol and the advancement of their heart disease. I do sometimes have to cut out nuts and seeds. There is a lot of data on walnuts and omega-3 fatty acids and walnuts and almonds. And so if, um, if we're going to eat nuts, that's typically the ones I recommend, but you know, cashews have magnesium in them and, you know, the handful should not be, you know, maybe your hand may be bigger than mine. So people are like, oh yeah, I just had a handful of nuts. Oh yeah. You have a small, you have a lean hand. So that's the right amount. Whereas I have some people that are like, oh yeah, this many nuts, you know, so of course, you know, that's going to be a problem a little bit too much. So this is sort of the goal, um, for the nuts for the day. Um, but then again, if you have more advanced disease, I sometimes have to cut the nuts out. It sort of depends. I, I kind of keep them at the beginning unless they are really advanced. And sometimes I'll have to say, look, this has to go or it can stay. If you're going to do seeds, I recommend chia seeds and flax seeds, again, loaded with omega-3 fatty acids will decrease in omega-3 fatty acids. Remember are anti-inflammatory. They decrease, remember body on fire, anti-inflammatory, uh, decrease, um, they decrease your triglycerides, um, which is really important, which is the kind of the sugars and fats of your cholesterol. Um, so it has that benefit as well. Um, so those are in terms of oils, I'm not a fan of oil. Um, I try no, to, you're, oil. you're, you're, you're <laughs> preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in general, people say, well, can I have a little bit of oil? Okay. If that's, if that's where I can get you, okay. But if I can get you to completely eliminate, I mean, I think the difference is, is that most people are here and we're trying to get them here, but I'm okay with here. Like I'm okay with really close. And so if you need a, a tablespoon or two to use to cook an onion, okay. But what I usually tell people most of the time, it's a, um, it's a, a learning how to cook um, with no oil, which is the art. And so some people think their food burns if they don't use oil. And so often it's just that you have to use the right pan, the yeah. right amount of heat, and you got to not walk away and have a little party. You'll, you'll lose your food. You got to sit right next to it and really kind of own that food. But um, then you can cook with that oil. Yeah. What about spices? We talked earlier about turmeric and how, you know, that's your gold. So I want you to see my cup because it, do you see the color of that inside, baby? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. Is, that is stained. <laughs> <laughs> I stained that color now. Um, so yeah, you know, I, so there are certain things that people don't realize about spices is that there are certain phytonutrients. So I mean, plant nutrients that you can only get from um, spices. So for instance, uh, curcumin, which is turmeric, which is, you know, what we were going to talk about, um, can only be got or obtained from turmeric. So I grow, uh, I must have 50 turmeric plants in my backyard. I, I'm embarrassed to say, but not really, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> so I have like, I harvest this much turmeric from each plant and we, we love it. We hug it. We bait, we put a blanket on it. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we dehydrate it and we grind it and we use it, uh, all the time because it's really potent anti-inflammatory. If you compare it to NSAIDs or anti-inflammatory meds, like, um, ibuprofen, uh, when they were compared head to head, small trials, admittedly, um, they were considered equal. Uh, I use it every day. I find that my joints do better. If it's a placebo effect, I don't care. You know, and so people say that a lot, you know, well, what do you know if it's, it could be a placebo effect? So what, if, if the placebo works on me, it's good enough. Yep, yep. What, um, <clears throat> I'd love for you to talk a little bit about water um, because it seems like most Americans probably are a little dehydrated. You know, our body's 60, over 60% water. You actually talk about how coffee, sodas, juices, and uh, energy drinks actually have a dehydrating effect. Um, what, what's your opinion on water? So, you know, the more you drink, the better is, is I guess the general thought and what's the right number. We yeah. don't know. We don't know the right number, you know, the standard eight cups of water. I looked that up to figure out actually where that came from. And we, we don't actually know. It's like this random thing that somebody came up with and said, yeah, eight cups seems about right. You know, it probably is about right. The truth is, but we don't know for sure. Uh, you know, some people need more, some people need less. I can't use urinary. Um, so if you drink a lot of coffee, I have to remind people that coffee, coffees and teas um, are diuretics. So they make you pee. And so you can't say, oh, you know, I, I'll pee every hour.
hour, but you drink coffee yeah. every hour too, you know? And so that's not a good indicator. And so you, I always tell people, if you drink a cup of coffee, you should drink at least a cup or two of water with it at the same time. Um, and you can look at your skin, you know, sometimes I look at people and their lips are all dry and, you know, you can see their tongue and how much water do you drink? Uh, I also have the benefit of looking at people's labs and I see they're dehydrated. So yes, people are dehydrated. Uh, your skin will do better. You will, you should urinate a lot, frequently clear urine. Uh, you should not have dark colored urine. That is not what we are looking for unless it's green. Then we'll, then we'll approve. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a joke. Uh, that was about the greens. Um, so, uh, yeah, lots of fluids, as much as you can drink, uh, less caffeinated drinks. Caffeine's okay. It's just make sure you're drinking enough water. Good water. I mean, yes, love the water. So you also talk about, I want to talk about two more things before we wrap things up and that's sleep and exercise and how like critically important those are, um, you know, with the body on fire. You actually say something in your book about sleep. Um, and I've never, that sleep, think of sleep as an antioxidant. And I never have before, but I love that. And also the fact if you're not getting enough sleep, it actually can, can, can act like an immune suppressant, which is not good. Absolutely. So the, uh, the American society and really the world now, we're just not sleeping enough. The average uh, human adult should sleep between seven and nine hours per night. Uh, that's really not six, uh, that's seven to nine. Um, we know that when you sleep less, your immune system's on overdrive. We know that um, your cortisol levels are higher, which are your stress numbers. People can't lose weight as well when they don't sleep because you have too much cortisol. When you have too much, uh, if you don't have that restoration that comes from, just think about how your mom used to tell you, or my mom used to tell me when I had a cold, go sleep and you wake up and you feel great. That's absolutely true when you sleep, your body has a chance to not focus on eating, thinking, doing all these other things that half that our body has to focus on can really just focus on the one thing that's ailing it, which is the illness. That's why sleep works. And so we like shut the rest of us off and really focus on that one thing. So absolutely seven to nine hours. And I think our children aren't sleeping enough. I mean, anyone no. who knows me knows that I'm like kids, in bed right now, that's it, you know? And so um, the kids have to sleep nine to 11 hours, depending on the age group, you can look it up at the American Sleep Association. But my kids, for instance, in the, their age group need to sleep at least nine to 11 hours. I don't care what has happening in the world. We're sleeping nine to 11 hours when we're kids uh, and our kids just don't sleep enough. Yep. And I've read that almost 50 to 75 million Americans um, are, have some sort of a sleep disorder. No. which is, which is really unfortunate. What do you have yeah, some like sleep apnea? And I mean, there's so many issues yeah. with obesity than the sleep apnea, right? Do you have, do you have some uh, suggestions for sleep hygiene? Absolutely. So one of the things in particular is put away your darn phone. Uh, you know, don't take away my phone. Don't do that. Phone. So, um, you know, we have a rule in our house actually today. I've just bought today, even something to take it up a notch. But, you know, I don't use my phone often at night, but admittedly, it creeps back into all of our lives. Again, the key is not to judge ourselves for what we did wrong, but how we're going to improve for the next day. So now I'm actually moving my phone to another room. You just put it down. You don't need it. There's nothing on that phone that's that emergent. And, you know, so I always tell people, don't use your phone for at least one hour before bed. Like, what do you mean? Nothing? Reading? No. You cannot use an electronic device for one hour before bed. Not to mention the blue light, which actually prevents you from feeling tired. Um, and so that's another issue that happens with phones. So no device is one hour before. You can okay. talk to your spouse, you can listen to music, you can meditate, you can breathe, you can snoop, whatever you want, but not device. Yep. yep. Um, what about dark room? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, sorry, so other things for sleep hygiene. Yeah. So, you know, some people say don't um, work in the same place that you sleep. Uh, that's never worked for me. I typically lay on my bed and work on my computer, um, but it, there just has to be boundaries. I think that's the key is that the time, there has to be the ritual in the, you have to worship the sleep. And that's how I always think about it and that you have to honor it. And so you have to put away your stuff. You have to have a bedtime ritual. Maybe don't take a shower right before bed. Don't exercise before bed. All of those things really make you more endorphins go up, not down. And then just maybe have a bath or massage you use a massager or some dark room, relax, make sure there are no lights from all those electronics. They're all in everybody's rooms. 
get your dogs out of your room. I had a woman who told me she just can't sleep. I was like, how many pets sleep in your room with you? And she's like, well, I have a cat and two dogs. I was like, okay, they are going to start. So like the pets have to leave the room, you know, and it's not that you don't love your pets, but they don't have to be there. Sleep should be honored and worshiped. I worship my sleep. Yep. I love it. And then the last thing, let's talk about exercise. I know that you're now, are you still doing triathlons? I haven't done one in a while. So I've been swimming a lot and you know, COVID is, I still run a lot more than I should probably. I'm I'm an obsessive runner. You know, I just love it. And now I've got these books on tape. So I'm like, don't want to stop running. I'm like, no. So um, I do a lot and I still do a lot of yoga. Um, But, you know, I think what I think that's the thing to remember about exercise in my clinic people tell me that one of my best pieces of advice, and this is why I'll give this right now, and um, is that I often tell patients who don't exercise at all, I ask them to exercise for five to 10 minutes a day. And sometimes, and people, I tell you this because people over and over again tell me that that has the one thing that made them exercise because I made it very doable. And so I think that that's the key. Like when we tell patients go out and exercise for an hour, they're like, what? I don't do anything. Like, how can I do that? So just start with five minutes or listen to some music and dance around the room or, you know, do stuff like where you're, um, you know, walking with your kids or just put, put the alarm on, start it and then stop it. It can only be five minutes. And I always tell them, start your alarm, switch, your, switch off your alarm. You do exercise for that five minutes and then you're done. They're like, well, what if I want to do more? Well, you can do more, but that doesn't mean that you next, you can tell yourself the next day, well, I did 10 yesterday, so I don't need to do five today. So so then you got to do five every single day. And then after two weeks, we build up. So exercise is super important, increases endorphins, dilates blood vessels, clears out your head. God, I mean, it's just, it's so good for you. I'm a huge proponent. It's great for your heart, great for my joints, great for osteoporosis and sarcopenia, which is breakdown of the joints and thinking is clear. Absolutely. So it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of exercise. I know you are. I know you, that's For your sure. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's one of my things. One um, of your things, right? <laughs> so I, I want to finish with optimism. So how, I mean, I love optimistic people. I find it so easy, especially in this day and age, to be pessimistic and to be kind of a bit of a downer. So why do you have a whole chapter on optimism? So I give out a survey to everyone when they come into my clinic, it's two or three pages, admittedly kind of long, but the last question on the survey is, are you happy? Mm -hmm. And nine out of 10 people say no. And um, that's really sad. So that chapter comes from that feeling, you know? And so I guess, um, so optimism is important for everything. If you don't feel hopefulness, then nothing else will happen. You can't eat healthy or go out and walk your dog or exercise if you don't have that hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And so people will say, well, it's easier said than done. In fact, somebody on Instagram emailed me and said, "Um, I had something happen to me six years ago that I regret and I still carry that with me. You know, but I think the key on optimism is you have to remember that we all have bad things happen to us or things and you wonder, gosh, should it have happened this way or should I have answered this thing differently? But, you know, there's that old Chinese farmer adage, which I really love. And I know we got to finish, but it's, you know, the guy, the guy's in the village and he's working on the farm and the farm and the, and the horse Lee runs away and the villagers come over and they say, man, you lost your horse, bad luck. He goes, maybe yes, maybe no. And then the horse comes back again and he brings seven horses with him and the villagers come over and say, Hey, great, great luck. You know, so lucky. He goes, ah, oh, maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> And then his, then his son tries to tame one of the new horses and he is on the horse and he falls off and breaks his leg. Villagers come back and say, you broke your leg, yeah, bad luck. Maybe yes, maybe no. And the next day is the draft and the, the kid doesn't actually end up going to war because he broke his leg. So, you know, I don't know. I guess, I guess what I would say is, is that life is hard. It's hard right now. It's hard for everyone. But I remember that, you know, if you were sick with COVID, you're better now. Or if you're healthy and you're stuck in your house, you're okay. You're not sick. You know, that's okay. And just try to get outside more, try to feel, remember how much, how much beauty there is in the world and how the sun shines and how you get to eat healthy foods. I was listening to Malala the other day. She gave a talk at university of Florida and she was reminded me how many kids, like my kids, there's so many kids on digital Academy here and they're complaining about digital. Uh, And then I, and she reminded me that there's so many kids around the world 
that don't even have access to digital academy. So they're like sitting at home, hanging out, right. doing nothing. And so is optimism important? Absolutely, because you can't do anything else in your life well if you don't do it with joy and hopefulness. And I think that so much of the time, frankly, in my clinic, I focus on that to start because we write positivity journals and we start thinking, sometimes I'll tell people, I want you to look in the mirror and see one thing about yourself that you love. Mm. People often will say there's nothing that they love. And I'm like, what, you know, what I see is your eyes are beautiful, or I love the way your hair fluffs up, or I love the way you, uh, your shirt today, or, you know, just the sort of when you start changing the way you look at something, everything changes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been a um, really great conversation, Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for all the wisdom that you're imparting to all your, all your patients, for your passion, for your, for your love of um, oh, empowering people with this, with this knowledge. Thank you for getting this out into the universe, body on fire. Um, it's, it's great. And it's been fantastic um, getting to visit with you. I have, it's been fun. So thank you so much for having me. Is your body mad at you, as Dr. Agrawal describes? Are you in a state of constant debilitating inflammation? Perhaps now is the perfect time for your own diet and lifestyle intervention to set you on the path to recovery and vitality. To learn more, visit our show notes at plantstrongpodcast.com. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to subscribe, rate, and review at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the great news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything to me. Have you had your own Galileo moment that you'd like to share? What happened when you stepped into the arena and shed the beliefs that you thought to be true. I'd love to hear about it. Visit plantstrongpodcast.com to submit your story and to learn more about today's guests and sponsors. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.